First, let me tell you what this is. Uh, this is something called a verified resume. And it has to do with the uh, soft skills that the Scans Commission came up with, but I'm going to go down the list uh, that's here and talk about some of the cultural differences that have to be dealt with when people deal with these skills that are very important but are not part of the typical academic record. And I'm going to ask you what you think about it. Uh, it's my view that employers don't know what uh, A in Algebra 102 means, but they do know what this stuff means. So this, in fact, is a, a resume that I gave to one of a number of students from a very disadvantaged section of Baltimore who had a summer job. And the summer job had to do with a project that Johns Hopkins had, which was to reduce obesity in the community. And they were using cell phones to tell people, don't eat that donut for breakfast. And here's where you shop for uh, fruits and vegetables instead of fast food and so forth and so on. And we thought a human touch, uh, especially from somebody in the culture of the disadvantaged area of Baltimore, uh, might have. And so we enrolled these kids. And so the first thing here is uh, responsibility. Uh, let me ask how many of you think if you hire somebody, uh, responsibility is an important characteristic? Who, who doesn't think it's an important characteristic? All right, so the responsibility here was to make four contacts and bring four people in. I'll just tell you one example of a, of a different view of responsibility. I was in Indonesia, and there was a tire factory in Indonesia, and the production line ran off a big motor, a great big motor that, that fueled or drove this production line, and it started to overheat. But nobody thought it was their responsibility to tell the boss, and they all knew the story of what happens when you bring bad news to the boss, so nobody told the boss. And the motor got hotter and hotter, and then it burned out, and they had to shut down the production line. But those of you who have traveled extensively or come from other countries uh, know that there's different views of, of what your responsibility is for things. So anybody have any ideas about uh, how in the Congo or Indonesia or Pakistan uh, responsibility is viewed somewhat differently from the US view of responsibility? Is, is it always the same? Or does it, does it for example, uh, there have been complaints about the US immigration Process. Okay, so uh, that's not restricted to the United States. And do you, do you think the people in your country, or the country you came from, or the country you went to, who process visitors and immigrants, think it's their responsibility to make you welcome? Or you're just another stamp on your passport, and what are you bothering us for? Any differences? That's right. I mean, we, we have cultural differences even company by company. Some companies think if you call, it's their responsibility to see that you're satisfied. Some think, oh, no, that's a different number. Call 6218. They say it quickly, and you don't know who to call. And so there's this aspect of responsibility. But the justification that I'm talking about is 
it would be good for youngsters who are brought in on internships to be told what their responsibility as a visitor or an intern is and to have their supervisor, you'll notice at the bottom of this thing, I signed off on it. And I gave the youngster a grade, but it doesn't have to be for a youngster. And I wrote, managed to make contact with four people so that I told the youngster that that was his responsibility to get four adults into Hopkins to be weighed and have their blood pressure taken and see if they were diabetic and so forth. So my view is, and I'm glad to see we have an employer here, uh, would, would knowing what the responsibility is and how youngsters have discharged that responsibility be worthwhile. So why can't we do it in some of the programs we have, those of you who run internship programs? The next one was team player. Well, there were three other youngsters and they had to work in a team. Again, it's important, more important today in the 21st century to be a team player and know how to work uh, with a team. And uh, is that different from country to country? Or is that important in the work, in the work you do, that people know how to, to work on a team? Now, we, we have some people here from Nigeria. I heard a, uh, uh, an oil company who said they wanted the Nigerian engineers who were technically quite competent to work in a team and they had a system to see if the team couldn't figure out what to take on a, a trek into the mountains and the Nigerians were very awkward in a team situation. It was not common to them. Uh, people say Asian cultures that are rice growers are naturally inclined to work in a team because you have to ha harvest rice uh, when, it's, when it's ripe and you can't, and everybody in the community, many of whom don't work, outside of the harvesting time, have to participate in cutting the rice wh when it's ready, especially when they use wild, sea wild rice seeds and they mature at different times, you had to keep coming out. This thing done by their supervisor in an honest way, I would give it more consideration. But the business of architecture, as we carefully say, is a business of pictures. It's visual. We, 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 I, uh, I'm, I'm very bad in saying and people don't like me, especially Katie here who wrote our book and I said, nobody reads. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not going to be proud of saying, I'm telling you the fact. I mean, people look at the stuff. Lifespan of a, you walk into a room, the, the research shows, within first three seconds, people have judged you probably 97% and you haven't opened up your mouth yet. They're going to look at how you look, how you dress, how your hair is cut. Can you walk straight? Can you look straight? Can you smile? And you haven't even sit down on your chair yet. And you have been judged. This is life. Nobody reads. Well, I hate to use the word nobody. And she'll be out of business if, if I say that. I, I started my career early on as in New York City uh, and knew a lot of architects since they were our clients. And good architectural firms have good people to pitch proposals and projects. And if you couldn't speak well orally and couldn't describe a complicated project and where the traffic moves and why this is a good idea, which your portfolio would say nothing about, then you had a limited career 
as an architect. Uh, I myself, as an engineer, wrote to a client when I was in my 20s. And being an engineer, the boss, right, the, the head of the firm, which was the best mechanical engineering company in the, maybe in the world, he was shocked that I could write a coherent letter because I was an engineer. And you know about engineers, right? An outgoing engineer looks at your shoes instead of his own shoes when he talks to you. So it's not only the portfolio. And I would want, if I was setting up an architectural school, to make sure that that student could pitch his project or her project to, to a group of people in a way that they would want to go forward with the project. And I would like to grade them for that. So if you are hiring people out of your internship program that you said you're going to fund, or out of an architectural school, you knew that that person could, could talk. Now, if you're doing work in China, if he or she could speak Chinese, that would be a plus also. And so what I'm suggesting is that this document is more important as a prod to the teacher or the mentor than it is as, as a document. Because if I came to work for you and worked under one of your partners, and they never let me make the pitch, they, they took that all on themselves and never taught me, I'd feel I don't want to work here anymore because they're not interested in my development. Where that other partner over there brings his people along, and so I'd like to work for somebody else. So I'm suggesting having this kind of document as not only a document, but as a prod to learning and teaching so the Nigerians know they don't need only to know about their engineering, petroleum engineers. Wisdom here is communicate. And that is extremely important uh, in this today's world because we have to work as a team, we have to work together. And I mean, that's an it's a whole different dialogue and a lot more time. How do you build multicultural teams and in above and beyond this symposium's topic? And that is what we go through every single day. Uh, communication is the key, and language skills are important. We fund uh, a lot of people who come in who are good and they have a hard time speaking. And we basically go through, tell them uh, very politely, you need to improve your skill set. You, we fund and go through community college to speak English. And supposedly they're supposed to know that, but it doesn't happen. So we fund and we, we basically send them to speak English because there are some people who are extremely talented. Um, and it's a very big cultural thing uh, to get away from that shyness of talking. Uh, some people like from Eastern cultures I've seen, like people from Korea, people from Indonesia, um, people from Pakistan, I mean like me, they, 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 we don't want to talk. And I'm very much opposite to it because I programmed my head to one day and I said 15 years ago, I got to do exactly opposite to what my mind tells me, so I got to reprogram my head. And I tried to do that, I was very much somebody, my, my, my mom and dad used to tell me, you don't speak, you got to speak, you got to speak, and now people can't shut me up. So, so, so the, prob the issue is communication, it's very essential. Uh, if you cannot communicate in our business, you can't communicate your ideas. Uh, you, have, you can't do a sales pitch. You can't grow. You can't be a team leader. A team leader has to speak and, and, and collaborate. So communication is the key to DDG's work and DDG's success. We got to teach. And when we, uh, when we hire people, that's a very big part of the interview to understand how to speak. Uh, I, we hire from China. I mean, we have about uh, four uh, of our designers, my team, in China. And they speak full in Mandarin, and they are actually our translators. Uh, we have uh, three people, four people who speak Russian. They're very important because we sign Russian documents. We go through our go-to meeting and conference call multilingual generally. Uh, Russian gets speaking in English, they get translated. We have sp uh, Chinese go through the same thing. Our daily emails go through multilingual. Uh, the project manager, um, 
who let's say doesn't speak Chinese, like Dustin here, my partner, he, he and I used to work in China, I used to write everything in English and Nan, um, uh, basically translate into Chinese and we send this in a Chinese and the email comes back into Chinese next day, Nan translates it and I can see it, what's going on, this goes on every day and thank God Ness for Google Translator. I can see the email coming in at two o'clock in the morning and I can quickly get a gist of it and I can understand it. That's what my life goes on Google Translate. I live on it. Um, Saad speaks Arabic, okay? We have people who speak about 26, 27 languages in this office, in this facility. People who are around you because that is our life. We have to live that. English is just a staple. You have to speak it, otherwise you're not gonna go anywhere. But you, in our business where we are working in 50 countries, our revenue, I'll give you an example, realistically, DDG's business, before 2008, we used to do about 60 to 65% work in United States. Our revenue used to come about 65% from USA, about 35, 40% used to come from the rest of the world. 2008 changed everything. We used to get phone calls weekly, daily, three, four call, uh, stop my work, shut down the project, stop, 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 stop. And within a matter of 30 days, we have US project, how many? Zero, literally zero, whole thing stopped. So what do we have there? Uh, people, and that is what people start to take, if I use the word very carefully, and I'm gonna use the word in a funny way, but serious way, the best thing happened for me personally, for get some respect, was 2008, because uh, before that, nobody cared what I did. I was sitting on one corner, and here I am putting in, you know, a million plus miles on airlines trying to find business, and I was bringing it, but nobody was paying attention because visibly nobody wanted to give me any credit. So here comes 2008, and the whole U.S. shut down, and here was, well, Ken, how can you help? Well, I have 15 clients in China. Who wants to go to China? I have four clients in India. I have five clients in Indonesia. Everybody wants jobs. So we were literally sh took this ship of DDG around. We were doing 100% billing out of overseas for three years to stay in business. We were in some months, we were doing some quarters actually, let me correct myself, we are doing 100% billing out of China. 100%. Every cent of money which we were paying out to employees, salaries, and part of building the team in diplomacy was people understood. We have a meeting here in this room, got everybody, okay guys, uh, at the hit, the, the word shit hit the fan, this is reality, okay, everybody's on a pay cut. From partners level to CEO level, everybody. And we're gonna put it together, we got everybody a 20% pay cut, and that's the way the world is. If we appreciate you staying here, but if you can't, we understand. We would love to have you here. And you know what? Not a single person left. Everybody stayed together because they knew we were being fair with them. And we were being honest with them. And we turned the ship around. It took us a while, but we turned it around and nobody left. And we got the pay back to everybody and they knew they could trust us. And that is part of the team building and so that is why you know people traveling like crazy to China, to Indonesia, to Turkey, to India, to Dubai, to Saudi Arabia, to South Africa, to Egypt, wherever the work was, we were going and we were billing 100% overseas. So culturally why it's important, I can tell you one thing. This is nothing against anybody. I grew here. The biggest crap I heard from were from my American-born employees and partners. Nobody, they did not understood or appreciated how much it takes to do this. They never got out of the country, and the people who stood behind me and traveling with me were all, every single one were born outside the country. There were a few, I mean, I'm not talking to every partner's American, there were a few who were really smart and they understood, and this guy is sitting one of them. And that's why, I mean, he, he stood by me, and he knew what was important. And there was another partner of mine, Valerie, who you saw. There were two out of everybody who said, we get it. But everybody was, well, why do we have to go to China? And I said, that's so we can pay your paycheck. <laughs> so, so this is a complex issue. There's a lot of um, uh, issues involved. And I told them, I said, you, listen, I, will, I would love to come home and my wife would love me to be at home. 
at 5 o'clock for dinner, but unfortunately I can't. I'm going to be somewhere because so everybody has a job. And that idea still doesn't stick to people. It's, a, it's an important item. And sometime you, at some time, you kind of stop and say, cut this crap and let's go forward. I don't have enough time to waste, and you make decisions. And that is one of the reasons, I'm, I'm honestly saying, I tell you in my earlier speech that three people come in who were senior partners, they resigned. And I tell you, that helped me to build a better company. Because we, I, and I, that's what I tell, I say that's what they sold their blessing in disguise. That's the best thing happened to company because they left before me allowing me to fire them. Because we cleaned up those, and one of them was very proud to choose to say he's a bigot. So we had to clean up the house from those bigots, and we had to clean up the house from people who did not appreciate the talent, who did not appreciate that people coming from outside are people, and they need to respect them. And, and that is why there is a cultural change in DDG, what we are able to do. Uh, go through a, a couple of things and get off the, the podium here. I just will mention that we have many Koreans here. And uh, I think in school, speaking out and questioning the instructor is uh, not something that people do very easily. And uh, in the US, when they come here, that's a different story. Can I get the slides, please? So who's Anybody? Can we, I, we have a couple of slides. Uh, yeah, for my presentation, right? right is there here? So back 20 odd years ago, the Secretary of Labor at the time set up this commission to determine what skills one really needs in the workplace of the 21st century. It was done on an American basis, but it's been picked up in many other countries. I get the PhD students from Thailand for some reason, but it's in South America and elsewhere, and they come up with their own version of these. So there's basic literacy and numeracy skills and problem-solving skills like communication and collaboration and critical thinking and creativity and planning, these never show up on a, on a school transcript. And USAID, uh, when they develop internships or they have projects that's supposed to be technology transfer or know-how transfer, needs to bring these in and then these are behavior or character attributes. This one grit is the new hot number that psychologists have used. It's a better predictor than your SAT scores as to whether you will complete college. And our host today showed, if anything, what the value of grit is. You don't give up when the partners quit, you say, that's a way to build a better, uh, a better company. But this is too vague. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, how do I get to the next slide? So you got to get down to the occupation you're talking about. So if you're going to be a medical technologist, I spent some years at Hopkins, so you have to speak about medicine when you're at Hopkins. I just read a book, by the way, of the making of the Panama Canal, where the key factor was the engineer, but just as important was the public health guy who cured the malaria and yellow fever that stopped the French from being able to do it. And the book talks about the cultural differences between the highly theoretical French and the very pragmatic American. So 
the French failed and we succeeded. But here's the kind of problems that they need to know how to solve. Understand the hospital. But again, if, if you're a planner and an architect and you're building a hospital complex, you better know something about medicine. And, you know, I'm walking around in a, with a bad foot, uh, and I need to be able to get to places. So, and here's behavior. Like responsibility on a construction job means you wear your hard hat and your hard toe shoes. Responsibility in a hospital is nothing about a hard hat or safety glasses, but it's about biology and bacteria and keeping the place clean. And then their specific knowledge is the same. And the last chart is in the sheet you have in front of you. And I just want to conclude with those of you who work with USAID, those of you who are working with interns in these volunteer programs, right now what a student gets or is a piece of paper that says, I was an intern in that program. And the employer doesn't know what skills were used or achieved there. But if you use something like the sheet you have and you sign it off, whether it's for a visiting student or an American student going elsewhere, uh, that would be helpful because the student will learn it. Now, one of the cultural peculiarities of Americans is we like to count. We like to measure everything. That's why there's all these standardized tests. So this is a way to count, and the teacher, the mentor, the family, even if they're in with a family, and it's a kid, and the family says, oh, your responsibility is to mow the lawn. Did the kid sleep through the morning and then say it was too hot in the afternoon? I mean, I've had kids, many of you have had kids, getting them to be responsible is not easy. So it, this is an action thing. This is not a philosophy thing. This is an engineer's view, which means you've got to build it. The damn thing has got to work. And if you build an air conditioning system, it better work on the hottest days and not be inadequate. It's got to work. This is a working document to emphasize the skills that that commission suggested. And that commission had the senior HR vice president of companies like GE and IBM and Motorola. I don't think it had any architects or planners, unfortunately. But it's the same sort of deal. You have to be able to work on a team. You have to be able to be responsible. You have to be able to communicate in written form and, and oral form. And these are just as important, no more important, but no less important than the technical skills. Thank you.